Okay, on this program we're going to be talking about digital compositing. It's actually the first part of a two-part program, and uh, we will do an overview of all the concepts related to the topic. So this program is going to uh, approach compositing from a, uh, you know, not from the point of any particular tool. Uh, like the rest of the uh, programs that, that deal with the visual effects, we're going to be looking at it from a concept point of view, as opposed to how to use a specific piece of software to accomplish these effects. Digital compositing, to throw out a quick definition of it, is uh, the manipulated combination of different elements to make a single integrated whole. The tricky part is making it look integrated, taking these different elements that may have been captured at different times with different cameras and different places, and putting them all together so that it appears as if they were all shot with a single camera at, uh, at one time. Pretty much wherever you turn these days, you'll probably see digital compositing in action. Uh, certainly in every TV commercial that's made just about, there's digital compositing going on, uh, visual effects in film, obviously, and uh, even multimedia. It, you even see it in, in print advertising, really. The same concepts we're talking about uh, are used to put together single print images. But what we're going to be talking about is really more related to doing these same things with sequences of images, with footage that's been shot and, and wants to be put together. Uh, and particularly, uh, as is the topic of, of this whole program, how it relates to visual effects. Really, digital compositing in, in a lot of ways is the backbone of visual effects. There's a number of other disciplines that go with visual effects, including you know, practical stuff and um, 3D models and CG things like that, but really when it comes down to it, all of these different elements are put together using digital compositing. Historically, digital compositing is sort of came after the original compositing, which was done optically, uh, tools that were used to uh, combine pieces of film in an optical printer, for instance. A lot of the techniques that we're going to see we're really just taken directly from these optical tools and these optical techniques. They've just been adapted to the digital world. If you do some research historically on optical stuff, you'll see that uh, there's, a lot of this is nothing new. When computers entered the picture, uh, it was just a matter of making things uh, easier, hopefully, although in some cases it seems like it uh, probably makes it more difficult. Okay, a quick infomercial here first. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is uh, also contained in a book I've written called The Art and Science of Digital Compositing. There'll be some information at the end of this program on how you can purchase this book. Uh, you'll also notice if you already have this book that I'm stealing a lot of examples from it, and so some of this will be familiar, and you've seen that it was covered in the book as well. So there'll be a number of different terms and, and things that are thrown out here. Uh, hopefully we're reasonably consistent between the different programs, but it's important to understand that even within the industry, a lot of these terms aren't really that well standardized, and uh, it's just a matter of kind of getting exposure to, to different, uh, different people in the industry and different portions of the discipline to understand how certain terms are used and applied. We'll do our best to be consistent with what we talk about here, at least. We're going to be talking about digital compositing, and there's a number of pieces that relate to that that aren't going to be covered in the specific program, uh, in particular some of the issues about how these images are gotten into the computer in the first place. If you're interested in more information about how images are represented in, in a digital fashion, check out Forrest Key's program on film and video's digital images. And if you want more information about how this happens, the process of digitizing images, then look into his program on uh, post-production basics. We're going to be looking at a lot of different operations that can be applied to images to modify them. That's really going to be the thrust of the first section of this program, uh, which is different image manipulation and image processing tools. But the important thing to keep in mind, of course, is that the reason why we're using all of these tools is to modify an element that we're going to be putting into a scene. You've probably got a background plate or something and you want to put something in the foreground, a new element that was shot on blue screen or rendered as CG, and what you're using your compositing tools and your image processing tools for is to modify that particular element or image so that it fits better into the scene. And the first thing we're going to be looking at is color corrections. Um, there's any number of different ways that you can color correct an image, and 
You can certainly look at the math behind these different operations, but we're not going to spend a lot of time worrying about what's happening with the math. It's much more important to understand what the image looks like after you've applied a particular operation on it. Let's take a look at an image and discuss real briefly some stuff that's been touched on in other programs, which is what makes up the image. Um, certainly there are pixels in the image, the individual dots that make it up. We really don't worry too much about individual pixels when we're working on, on imagery. They're just too small a unit to be dealing with. Uh, instead, we are more concerned with um, dealing with individual channels of the image, the red, green, and blue channel. We'll take a look at those real quick for this image here, red, green, and blue. And uh, of course, we're also interested in the image itself, and then the sequence, the sequence of images that make up the whole length of the shot, typically. And a lot of times, we'll just be dealing with the elements at that level and not really even caring about the individual frame so much and just worry about it as a whole sequence. Brightness is a good example because it's about as simple as it gets. All we're really doing is multiplying the value of every pixel in the image by, by a certain amount. So if we take a look at this here, we multiply the, uh, the image by a value of two. Every pixel becomes twice as bright after we apply this brightness. Uh, there's a few issues to be aware of here. First of all, as you can see, a good chunk of the image goes to white. Everything gets blown out. It gets this look where uh, anything above 50%, in this case, uh, is pushed up to completely white. And that kind of brings up the point of how we're representing the image data. Um, I've got a graph here, as you can see, which is kind of a mapping of what happens to an image. It's, it's a tool we're going to be looking at for a number of these different color corrections. And it really just shows the function that's being applied to color correct the image. So in this particular situation, this graph we're looking at, first of all, uh, is a graph of no change at all. The value of any pixel that comes in is the same as what goes out. So if a pixel has a value of 0.5 in this particular function, then the result is also a value of 0.5. So let's look at a graph now of a brightness of 2. In other words, multiplying every pixel by 2. And you can see here that a pixel that comes in with a value of 0.5 has now been pushed to a value of 1. We are dealing with images where the range is 0 to 1. Uh, that's sort of a convenience. It's a way of simplifying the representation of the image. Uh, other systems or certain systems may deal with uh, digital information and give you the actual uh, number that's used to represent the value or the color of a pixel. So if you're working with an 8-bit image, that range might be in the 0 to 255 range, or if you're working with a 16-bit image, that uh, pixel could be represented with any number between 0 and 65,000. But it's a convenience we use that we just normalize everything so that it's really in the range of 0 to 1. It doesn't matter what's happening behind the scenes. This is just something that the computer will do for you and just tell you that uh, everything is normalized between 0 and 1, and you can work on it in that way. So when I say a pixel has a value of 0.5, uh, that means it's at about 50% brightness, or at exactly 50% brightness. And uh, of course, we're talking about this as if a, a single pixel um, has a single value, but of course, we know that pixels really have three values, red, green, and blue values. But by the way, I just tossed out this uh, issue of 8-bit versus 16-bit, and, and really it boils down to how much information is being dedicated uh, in your computer and, and with your image for representing a specific color. Uh, again, this was touched on in some of the other programs in the series. There is certainly an issue that you will always need to be aware of when you're dealing with digital images, which is you know, how much information do you have there, and uh, in particular, what can you do to it before you start to degrade the image. It's a constant concern. There's, there's certainly a fallacy that if you're working in the digital world, um, you've got a perfect system and you won't lose any data, and that's completely untrue. It's, it's extremely easy to do things to an image that will destroy data, data to the point where it can't be recovered. And so you've always got to be aware of what kind of bit depth you're working at and what kind of information you have. There's a number of tricks for getting around this. Um, we'll discuss one of them a little bit later, which is storing images in, in the logarithmic space or in some kind of nonlinear color space. And that'll be tested on toward the end of this program. But um, Again, the, the main thing is to be aware of what you're doing to your data, and that's, that's one of the main reasons why you've got to understand these color corrections, uh, at the very least from the point of what it's doing to the image, and ideally also from the point of what it's doing mathematically to the image. So if we look at the situation where we were doing the brightness of two 
to an image, multiplying every pixel by two times. Uh, because we've pushed everything up to the highest possible value that we can represent in our range of 0 to 1, what that means is that everything was above that value of 0.5 has effectively been lost, or at least it's been, you know, everything has been pushed to the same value, a value of 1, of white. And uh, if you take a look at this particular image that we're working with here, we've applied the brightness of two times. You've got an image where a good piece of it has gone to white. And if we try to do something after this in terms of maybe decreasing the brightness again, you can see that if we bring these values down, you run the risk that you've lost this data at the high end, and it doesn't come back when you decrease the brightness. This, uh, this situation may or may not occur, depending on what kind of software you're working with. Some software takes care of this issue and, and looks at what you're doing for the entire sequence of color corrections and notices that if you're doing a brightness of two times and then following that with a brightness of 0.5, that those two really consolidate into no change whatsoever. But a lot of uh, software in a lot of situations, even with the best software, can't always uh, do these things for you. And you really shouldn't rely on your compositing software or your image processing software to keep you out of hot water. You've got to be aware of what you're doing to the data. I'll probably mention that a number of times as we go throughout this program, uh, because it is so important and it's so easy to do, to corrupt your data or to throw away stuff that later on you find you need. It will show up as a number of different artifacts in your system, not just like the one we've seen here, which is the high end gets corrupted, but uh, banding artifacts, and, and those will show up as well, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. So that, again, the, uh, the operator we just got done looking at, the brightness operator, is multiplying every pixel of the image by a certain value. Uh, we certainly don't need to do that uh, equivalently for the red, green, and blue channels. We can multiply the red values by one, one value and, and multiply the green by a different value, for instance. And this will give a color shift, as you can see in the image here. We're multiplying red by two times, but we're leaving the green and blue channels the same. And we've effectively made the image appear to be much more red. Probably about now you're starting to realize that some of these terms that we use in, in casual conversation uh, where we're discussing what's happening to an image are not that precise. So if I say the image appears brighter, there happens to be a specific compositing term or image processing tool, you know, multiply, that is sort of agreed upon as being uh, what happens or what a brightness is defined to be. But uh, that's by no means true for all of these different terms. And even the brightness term, if you're dealing with somebody that isn't a compositing person, uh, they may very well say, I want this image to be brighter. But they may not really mean, I want you to apply a multiply to the image. There's a number of different tools, and we'll look at a lot of them, for making an image appear to be brighter in the sense of it just looks brighter, as opposed to the pure strict definition of the term. And you've really got to kind of interpret what the person is, is telling you they want based on uh, what you think they want. So let's look at some other operators now on the same image. Um, you saw what happened when you multiply a pixel by a certain value, and you saw what happened in the graph here. But let's go ahead and just add a value to this image instead. We're going to add a constant value of uh, 0.2 in this situation. And in this case, then, every pixel has 0.2 added to it. Um, this is different than a brightness, even though visually you could say that the image appears to be getting brighter again. But instead of multiplying, we're adding, and that means that everything at the low end is pushed up. You'll notice that areas that were um, formerly a dark, dark color or black are elevated. They're brought up. And um, this is an important difference. Sometimes you want it, sometimes you don't. It depends on what you're looking for. As you're working in compositing, and we haven't really touched on this a whole lot, but obviously the whole point of all of these color corrections is going to be integrating elements into a scene. Probably you're putting something into the scene and you want to affect it. So everything we've been looking at in terms of these color corrections so far has been what's considered a lookup table. Uh, it goes back to this graph we're looking at, which is um, for any given value that comes into the function, there's some value that goes out. So if we looked at uh, with this particular gamma setting, you can see a pixel that started with a value of 0.5 goes out with a value of uh, 0.7 or so. But another thing we can do when we're color correcting imagery instead of just applying a function is actually take a tool that lets us draw these graphs interactively. Uh, effectively, it's a curve manipulation tool that lets us explicitly put in some kind of a lookup table, some kind of a curve, and color correct the image based on that. So let me draw a quick little curve here, 
And you can see what I'm doing is I have control over this spline that's being generated. And what I'm saying is that I want to take the uh, low end of the image and boost it up a little bit. But about halfway through, I'm going to take this curve and pull it down some. So we're pulling the mid-range down a little bit. And then again, at the high end, we can push the values up. I can do this with all three channels just as easily. So I can take the red, green, and blue channels and do different things with them and get all kinds of uh, different color corrections going on here. Ultimately, this is probably the most flexible color correction tool there is because you can do anything you want within it. You can affect highs and mid ranges separately and really do very fine control over exactly what's going on with the image. Okay, while we're on the subject of uh, gamma and more specifically on uh, a color correction tool that only affects the mid range, let's also take a look real quick at something that's designed more to deal with uh, the highs and lows of the image and leave the mid range untouched. This is typically referred to as a contrast, uh, which fortunately is also sort of the colloquial term for what you're going to see, where basically the, uh, the high end of the image is going to be brought up to be even brighter, and the darks of the image are going to be brought down. The visual result is an increase in contrast. We can take a look at the graph of what happens here, and you can see it's somewhat gamma-like in its shape along both edges here, but it changes directions right in the middle. So the low end's pushed down, and then the high end is pushed up, and uh, the end result is, is a contrast increase. This, again, is one of those things that when you're matching elements together from different sources, the contrast can vary quite a bit. And so this is a useful way of uh, massaging your data so that it fits better with some other existing elements. Everything we've been representing in terms of uh, the color of an image, we've always talked about it in terms of red, green, and blue, or RGB values. Uh, but there are other ways of representing the color in the image. And sometimes these other methods of representing color are also useful tools for manipulating the color of the image. So another way of representing color is uh, what's known as HSV space, or hue, saturation, and value. And let's look at the, the simplest case of this in this color wheel that we have right here. In particular, this color wheel is really just showing us the hue and the saturation possibilities for an image. So around the perimeter of the wheel, you can see that the full spectrum is represented, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. This is really just a mapping of all the different possible colors. As we move towards the center of the color wheel, uh, we can see the saturation decreases. Values that are very vibrant around the edge become less and less so uh, until you get to the middle of, of the circle where everything is white and uh, completely unsaturated. The nice thing about an HSV representation is it's much more intuitive to people uh, talking in everyday terms. Uh, we tend not to refer to a color as being, you know, uh, 0.95 red and 0.8 blue and 0.2 uh, of green or something like that. Instead, what we tend to say is, well, it's kind of a magenta color. It's, uh, it's you know, magenta and it's fairly saturated or heavily saturated. And that's really what the HSV space gives us as well, is the ability to uh, numerically represent color in those terms. So if we want to play with the saturation of an image, um, we can go ahead and, and take the image and just drop the saturation down to half as much as it was, or even completely desaturate the image. Um, as you can see, we, we just did that to, to me. We can also play with the hue of an image. And usually the best way to deal with this, or the most common way of working on the hue in the image, is to kind of rotate it around this uh, color circle that we have, uh, effectively shifting every color in a particular image to an adjacent color. So if we slightly rotate the image, you can see that um, the colors in the entire scene change. And uh, if we go ahead and, and rotate the image by 180 degrees so that every image becomes its complement, uh, you can see what happens. Notice that it's not taking the negative of the image or the invert of the image. Bright values are still bright, and dark values are still dark. And the saturation still stays about the same. But the colors in the image have been shifted. A lot of times, this is really useful, uh, this HSV manipulation. Uh, saturation is probably the most obvious one. Just being able to take an image and desaturate it is, used, is all the time. Uh, because when you're shooting different elements in, in different uh, situations, um, any number of things can conspire to produce different saturations levels. Um, if you're shooting on film, the amount of lights you're getting, even if you're shooting on video, the amount of light in the scene or the way that the image is processed after it's been shot can affect the saturation of the image. 
and you'll probably need to use some kind of tools to modify that and match your different elements together. So another way of manipulating the color in an image um, is working with the individual channels and actually changing their order or replacing one channel with another channel. Um, as you know, an image is typically composed of a red, green, and a blue channel. And there's nothing to say that we can't uh, reorder those or place the red channel into the green channel or swap the two. Um, this is not necessarily a great tool if you want to get a specific color correction or if you're trying to tune an image to match the colors uh, to another image. But it's more often used for a number of other techniques. Most notably, probably, is some of the techniques for keying. If you look at Stu Mashowitz's program on keying and procedural mat extraction, uh, it'll talk a little bit about how the different records in an image can be, can be manipulated in order to pull a mat on an image or create a mat. And of course, I'll be talking about mats in uh, the second half of this program. So channel swapping or manipulating channels, if we go ahead and take a look at the blue channel on this image, um, you can see the, the parrots in front of a blue background. And so of course, the blue channel has got a fair amount of information where this blue background is. There are blue values in that channel. But if you look at a couple of the other channels, particularly the red channel, you'll see that there's, um, it's black there. There's virtually no information in the red channel because, of course, the color component is, is blue and there's very, very little red in it. So you can start to get a sense of how if we take the red channel and start manipulating it just by itself, um, we can start doing some combinations and help to pull a mat, help to create something that is just defined uh, where there is no blue in the image. Channel reordering can be used in a number of different situations as well. Sometimes it's useful for reducing the grain in an image, um, particularly on film and for very noisy film stocks. The blue channel is usually much grainier than some of the other channels, than the red or the green channel. Depending on the situation and the kind of colors you have in an image, it's not uncommon to maybe cheat a little bit and take some of the red channel and kind of bleed it into the blue channel, um, thereby slightly shifting the color, but also kind of eliminating some of the additional noise that's in the blue channel and averaging that, averaging that out. Whether this trick works or not is, is entirely dependent on the image and the kind of colors that are in it. It certainly works best on an image that's desaturated or completely monochrome, just because theoretically the three channels are the same there, but the blue channel having more noise, you could replace it with the red channel and probably not even notice the difference. If you have an image with a lot of vibrant colors in it, this trick isn't going to work as well but it's kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. So we've just got done talking about uh, a number of different tools for doing color corrections on an image. And chances are, if you pop into any number of different compositing packages or paint packages or something like that, you'll find that uh, there are a variety of additional different kind of tools for working with the color in an image as well. And in fact, probably these other tools, um, no matter what names they're given, are really just combinations of what we've already discussed. But there's really a variety of different ways that you can choose to build an interface for doing color correction. But the important thing to understand is sort of what the basic concepts are, the, the sense of pushing an image up and down within its range by doing an add or subtract, or a multiply, uh, or this gamma correction tool, or just overall a, a general tool for manipulating the hue of an image or the saturation of an image. So obviously, if you're sitting down to do work, to do compositing work, you'll need to know what specific tools the package you're using has. And ideally, you'll, you'll understand uh, not only how to use those tools, but really what's happening behind the scenes and how that applies to what we've discussed here, what it's really doing to the data in the image. And by doing that, um, you know, you'll become a more efficient compositor and you'll be able to produce the results you want, but you'll also uh, understand and be able to deal with situations where you can control any data loss uh, and, and make sure that you're doing the best things to the data that you can. So let's go ahead and talk about the next image processing uh, subject that we're going to be going over, which is uh, kind of falls under the category of spatial filters. Unlike color corrections, where we're dealing with uh, a single 
pixel coming in and another pixel going out, or you really only worry about the color of an image that's coming in to determine what's going out. Spatial filters are kind of used to, to look at uh, a group of pixels, um, or really the image as a whole, and modify it in some way. It's not a color correction, but it's things like blurring an image or sharpening an image. And we'll look at each one of these specifically and kind of talk a little bit more about what exactly is happening and what it's really doing, as opposed to what it looks like it may be doing. Probably the most common spatial filter is a blur. And if we take a look at uh, an image on the screen here and apply a blur to it, it, it's very obvious and intuitive what's going on. The image looks as if it's being defocused. One thing that's very important to understand is it's not actually the same thing as a defocus, though. In the uh, program that uh, I have that discusses um, visual effects cues, I talk a little bit more about what the difference is between a defocus and just a, a digital blur. They're not quite the same, but a lot of times you can get away with using them for the same thing. But what's really happening here is uh, we're kind of averaging all the pixels in the image together. We're, we're averaging them out and producing this kind of mushy result that appears to be defocusing the image. Uh, different packages have different ways of doing a blur, uh, some of them much faster than others, and uh, some of them which animate more correctly than others. So a lot of times you may have a tool that can go ahead and blur an image relatively quickly, but it may not be able to do that accurately over a sequence of images. Uh, you may see artifacts, uh, or particularly if you're animating the blur value to simulate some kind of a rack focus, for instance, where you want an, a scene to start out in focus and then go to being out of focus. Make sure that the tool you're using is able to animate that blur effectively uh, and not have noticeable steps or pops as, as you're animating the blur. It should appear very smooth. So given the fact that we're able to blur an image, it um, seems to make sense that, sense that we should be able to sharpen an image as well. We really can't. I mean, there's no real tool for recreating data that doesn't exist. If I shoot something out of focus, you know, there's less data in it. The image is, is out of focus, and, and some of this sharp detail is really completely lost. However, there is a trick that we use, and we call it sharpening, and it produces a visual result that appears to be as if the data and the detail in an image was being increased. So let's take a look at uh, the image that we've got on, on the screen here and go ahead and apply a sharpening pass to it. Visually, it probably appeared to have gotten sharper, to have gotten as if there's more detail. But what's really going on here is this filter that we're applying is sort of analyzing the image and finding areas of transition. It's finding edges in the image, and then it's accentuating those edges. So if you've got something that uh, goes from uh, bright to dark along an edge very abruptly, what the Sharpen tool is doing is accentuating that edge. It's actually slightly uh, darkening the dark area even a little bit more right along the edge, and it's increasing the bright area a little bit more along its side, and the visual result is as if it got sharper. Let's take a look at a graph of what's happening here. I've got the simplest case of a, an image where the left half of the image is dark gray and the right half of the image is a fairly bright gray. So this is a very hard transition between the two. And we're going to apply just a standard sharpening, but we've magnified it quite a bit so that the effect will be very obvious for what we're doing. Uh, let me go ahead and increase the sharpening here. And, and what you see is happening is the, uh, the edge is being accentuated. It's being you know, emphasized a lot more. If you look at the graph of what's going on here, you can see it, that the, uh, the dark stuff is being pushed down a little bit, the bright stuff is being pushed up a little bit. And if you do this over an entire image, it appears to be sharper. The danger with this tool is, is you can over-sharpen very easily, and, and it's subject to artifacts. Um, if you, if you over-sharpen an image, like we're doing on me right now, you can see that uh, any of the edges at some point start to ring. They start to have very bad problems showing up around the edges. And uh, particularly on film, if you over-sharpen stuff, the grain that's inherent in a piece of film will also be accentuated. So every little piece of grain becomes more and more noticeable as you apply more sharpening to that. And obviously this is, is probably something that you're not going to want. Usually what happens when you do sharpening is there's a, a real uh, trade-off between how much you can do before it starts to look like a problem instead of the effect that you're looking for. Another spatial filter is known as a median filter. And it's a really simple thing is what it does. It's, it's a useful tool 
particularly for removing artifacts or problems in an image, uh, single pixel artifacts, um, little noise spikes or something like that. What the medium filter does is it looks at a group of pixels, usually a three by three matrix or nine total pixels, and um, goes through and sort of orders these pixels in terms of their color values, and then replaces the pixel in the center with the average of the other pixels. The net result is that most pixels aren't going to change much since they'll all sort of be in the same range, but pixels that are way different than their neighbors will get replaced with something that's more like the average of their neighbors. The end result, as you can see in this thing, is that really bad noise spikes, little tiny noise spikes, uh, can be removed from the image. And there's very little damage done to the image itself, however. There's a slight softening. It, it, it's similar to applying a very slight blur to the image. The, the net result is, of course, much nicer since you can remove these noise artifacts. So like I said, the median filter is useful for eliminating noticeable anomalies in an image, small anomalies, little uh, single pixel problems, or occasionally small dots, or uh, the most common situation is maybe uh, little pieces of dirt that were on the negative and then uh, were transferred. So you see these little white dots on the image. The median filter applied to an image can very often eliminate these or at least minimize them. Sometimes if you apply a median filter a couple of times, it'll get rid of even more stuff since the first pass will kind of decrease the number of these problem areas and the second pass will get rid of it. Every time you do that, you'll slightly soften the image, but um, what can be done is once you've applied a median filter even a couple of times to an image, is then go back and compare it with the original image and do what's known as a threshold on that which is really the process of looking at every single pixel between the two images, the one that's had the processing done to it and the one that hasn't, and just saying that if a pixel changes by more than a certain amount, then go ahead and use the changed one. But if it doesn't change very much, then let's just say not use, you know, not use the change at all and just use the original. So the end result is you don't soften areas that don't have problems, and the only place that it gets affected is the area where there was a little bit of dirt uh, or noise that was showing up in there. It's not a magic bullet. It can't remove you know, any and all dirt or noise that show up in an image, but used in conjunction, in conjunction with some of these other tools and you know, eventually even some kind of paint fixes, uh, it can be a, a useful tool in your, in your toolbox for helping to remove problems. Another spatial filter that can be useful in uh, a lot of situations is an edge detection tool. And this is a little bit different than some of the other ones we were looking at in that it's going to produce an image that's probably not going to be used directly in your composite. Rather, it's sort of a, a step along the way to, to achieving some other goal. Let's take a look, first of all, at what we're going to do here. Here's an image that's basically just a white shape on a black background. This is the most extreme case of what we're going to show, but it makes the point uh, very well. If I apply an edge detection to this, this is the image that results. As you can see, it's the outline of the original image, if you want to think of it that way. It generates a new image that just has color information or is, uh, is noticeable information along the edges of the original image. And like I said, you're probably not going to want to uh, apply an edge detection to actually process the image and show that so much as you're going to use this edge to modify some other image. Uh, in the next program, we'll be talking a lot more about combining images together and using a control image that's known as a, as a matte channel or a matte image. Uh, it's a separate image that's used to sort of help you deal with how images are combined. And one of the most important things when you're combining images is how are the edges of uh, an element as you're laying it into the new scene. So this edge detection tool can create an additional control image for dealing specifically with the edges of the image. We'll talk about that a lot more in the, in the, next, uh, in the next program. Now the final class of image processing tools that we're going to be discussing all fall under the category of geometric transformations. A geometric transformation is literally some way of moving an image around on, in your workspace, typically moving an image relative to some other element in the scene. So if you're layering a foreground over a background, chances are good that you're going to want to position that foreground in a certain location. And to do that, you'll need to use some kind of a geometric transformation. They're very simple tools, things like uh, move, uh, or you may call it a pan as well, 
just a tool for taking the existing image and repositioning it. So if we take a look at our image here, first of all, I'll just pan it uh, over the black background where it already is. But more importantly, let's place it over some other background and look at the scenario where we're putting it into a composite and we're repositioning it, placing it somewhere specifically in frame. Again, this is just a pan, but there's any number of additional ones that we can use. The most common, of course, would be a rotate. So we'll go ahead and rotate this image now. You can see I'm kind of rotating it about its center, but you don't necessarily need to rotate it about its center. You can rotate it about some other arbitrary location as well. Uh, the result is slightly different. It's just another tool for, for repositioning or placing an element into the scene. Scaling an image is another thing you do with it as a geometric transformation, just making it smaller or larger. These are all so common, they're almost uh, you know, not even worth talking about, since you'll tend to do these in almost any, uh, any composite that you're working on. But there's a little bit more going on here that we do need to talk about, and stuff that you need to be careful about when you're doing geometric transformations. Just as was the case when we're dealing with color imagery, you know, we only have a certain amount of information there, and we've got to be careful that we're not corrupting it or we're not compromising its integrity. And geometric transformations have the same issue. You can, for instance, scale an image down and then later scale it back up, but this may or may not cause you problems. Let's take a look at a situation where it does cause problems. I will take the image, scale it down quite a bit, and I've produced a new, new image that's a lot smaller than the original. Uh, to do this, I've produced an image that's lost a lot of information. Uh, if I take this smaller image now and zoom it back up to even the original resolution, you can see it's very degraded. It's gotten much softer, and the reason for this should be pretty obvious. We threw away all the information when we scaled it down, and now when we try to scale it back up, the information isn't there. And you know, the system has some tools for interpolating what the pixel should be, they, but they can only reconstruct so much. So this is exactly like the scenario we looked at with color information, where if you uh, apply two different brightnesses, you know, they may destroy a lot of data. Same thing can happen with geometric transformations. And certain tools, um, certain software packages can help you get around this problem as well. Um, certain package will notice, can notice that you're doing uh, two different scales and sort of figure out what the net result is and only sample it as much as it needs to. So all the transformations we talked about so far kind of fall into the category of linear transformations. Um, it's a real obvious relationship between what the original image looked like and uh, what the destination of the affected image looks like. But there's a more general purpose tool for dealing with ways of distorting an image, and it's usually referred to as warping. So if we look at our original uh, example image here and apply some simple warping on it, you can get a real good idea of what the tool is capable of. And in this situation, we're sort of just using it to play with the image and produce something that looks uh, kind of interesting but it's probably not terribly practical to most situations. But really, warping is a very powerful tool that can be used um, at any stage of a compositing process, not used so much for uh, obviously affecting the image, but for doing very subtle things, for uh, slightly warping an image so that it fits better into a scene or so that the perspective appears to change a little bit on the image, um, or even you know, to, to nudge a, a piece of the image so it fits better next to another piece of the image. Warping is certainly uh, something that can be done, you know, in any stage of the process, and uh, you can do you can do a lot of different things with it. But most of the time, you want to be pretty subtle with it and not not uh, go nuts on it. Something that's real important to know about warping is you still have the same situation that you have with any transformation, and that you have a limited amount of data that you're working with. Um, there's a fixed resolution you're starting with. And when you warp an image, uh, you are grabbing a chunk of it and sort of pulling it apart from another piece of it. And what happens in between the areas that you're pulling uh, is that you can get stretching showing up. Uh, there's no real solution to this other than have, making sure that you have plenty of data to start with. So it's not uncommon if you're doing a warp that's going to distort an image quite a bit that you want to work at a higher than normal resolution. And then when you're done, uh, scale back down to whatever your final resolution is going to be. So all of these tools, these transformation tools that we've talked about, some of them we were moving as we were doing them, but we were kind of talking about them as, as they are applied to a single, single frame. But um, really when you move an object in the real world and capture it on a camera, there's an artifact that 
comes about because of this motion. This is discussed in much greater detail in, in the segment on uh, visual effects cues where it talks about what happens when you capture an image in the camera and, and some of the artifacts you see. But the particular thing that we want to talk about a little bit is motion blur. And when you move an object across the screen at any kind of speed and capture that on film or on video, you get an artifact that's, that's a blurring of that image. The faster it moves, the more it blurs. If we're working in a compositing package and we want to bring an image into the scene and move it across the screen or across the frame, we want to see that same kind of an artifact. Otherwise, it just won't look real. It'll look stroby and you'll, your eye will pick it out as being artificial. And for that reason, anytime you have a package that uh, lets you apply some kind of ge geometric transformation to an image, you also want to be able to apply motion blur to it. Um, the best scenario is that you'll just be able to turn motion blur on and set up a couple of uh, basic parameters and the software will take care of doing that kind of blurring for you. It'll base the blur, the amount of the blur, just on how fast the object is moving. If your software doesn't support that, there are ways to get around it. Your software may support um, just some kind of explicit smearing and you can just kind of manually smear your image a little bit and simulate this motion blur. Or you may have to resort to some more uh, arcane techniques of uh, doing a number of different small moves and kind of averaging them together, together to give the sense of it being a motion blur. So we've talked about a number of different image processing tools, color corrections and different filters for blurring and sharpening an image and uh, of course all the geometric transformations including warping that we just talked about. But this is really only a part of what goes on when you're doing a composite. If you go back to the original definition of compositing, uh, where I mentioned that it's the manipulated combination of elements, what we haven't talked about yet is actually the combination part of it. Um, we've manipulated elements, and we've discussed how to manipulate elements, but the next thing that really needs to be covered is how to combine these elements and put them together into a scene. That's what's going to be covered in the next segment of this program, and uh, so hopefully you'll check that out. If you're looking for some more information on this topic and also information on some of the other pieces of uh, the puzzle that I touched on throughout this program, uh, check out our website. The uh, address is listed below and uh, you can get a lot more information there and you can also even send some email to us and uh, get, some more, uh, get some more discussion going.